the actors who really make the impression for me and always have through my career are the ones who come in and do something uh, that is unexpected yet totally is supported by the text itself. All right, great. So today I'm here with LA casting director, Paul Weber. Paul, thank you for joining me. How you doing? Hey, Ashley, thanks. Um, this is fun. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. I was, uh, we were talking a bit before there and uh, yeah, I kind of know you from many, 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 many lives ago where we crossed paths on a networking thing in LA, like back in 09, but um, it's nice to sort of reconnect. I think this is the world we're in where we're like, you know, different continents, but amidst all this chaos, Zoom and the internet's kind of letting people connect or, or reconnect. How how have you found this sort of up and down topsy-turvy past almost two years now from a personal perspective and I guess also professionally? Well, I think we started doing these sorts of things within the first three to four or five months and there was a lot of hand wringing and and you know how do we all stay in this sea together different boats getting to the shore and getting through all this and you know trying to give each other as much support as possible i don't think that's changed i just think we're as um uh, as artists and just in general fairly resilient and uh, taking more and more of this uh, in stride, although I wish um, we would take it more seriously, especially with what's happening these days. And I know from a few of your other podcasts, it was like getting through it, getting through it. Now look where we are in December of 2021. Yeah. And uh, I just had um, uh, talked to a friend who's here from Amsterdam and looked like looks like Amsterdam and certain countries are literally starting to shut down a bit and, and England's gone through its problems as well too. I was in Zagreb um, and Italy and uh, um, Slovenia in October. I was actually teaching uh, a workshop in Zagreb live. It was so great to see actors mm. in 3D again. Um, and, uh, and that was sort of a window and gosh knows what's gonna happen coming up here. So it's been, extremely challenging. We are negotiating it pretty well considering, and I think that's generally the consensus. Uh, I have been virtual for even before COVID. Mm -hmm. The last couple of projects I'd worked on, especially television movies shooting in outside of Los Angeles, most of the casting we did, in fact, I think all of it was virtual. We didn't meet any actors live, and this was pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. So there was a tilt toward this sort of casting anyway. It's not what I got into the business for. And it's one of those things because I'm having been an actor, uh, originally trained as an actor, uh, that was part of what I loved about casting. But it's certainly um, adapted pretty well. We're very strict here in Los Angeles. Uh, the irony is that I can go to different locations in the world and actually teach a workshop, but I can't really do that in Los Angeles right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting. So I do tell actors that, you know, hunker in, stay where you are. LA's not going anywhere. We'll be here. And we're just pretty strict as far as our um, uh, industry mandates go, uh, more so than other places. And I think that's to protect the actors, the crews, and the industry as a whole. Yeah, I mean, I think that's sort of replicated to a degree as well in the UK. There's there's lots more around local hiring or people that physically, you know, just live like in the city in the UK being a small country, you know, even that like you have to be London based or based in the North if they're shooting a project in the North because they're just trying to mitigate as much as they can. One shutdown is going to, you know, cost Lord knows how much money for a production. And, you know, for some of the big boys, I think they can probably cater to that. But I know from a lot of chats with other people, you're an independent film, for example, that extra 15, 20, I've heard 30% on top of the original budget as a quote sometimes, that's just not going to be sustainable for an independent project, which 
is is understandable. It's also kind of sad because you know indie films obviously being a huge part of you know a good in way for for actors and. I'm always wondering, like, are we seeing less indie films now, or is it just that there's so much more content that it seems like there's less? I don't know how you find that from on your side. Well, having come from uh, from a studio where I was in charge of mostly television, yeah. Post studio, as an independent, I was really anxious to help out in the independent film world. A chance that I didn't have that much opportunity because of my my time requirements to be able to do help up and coming filmmakers and then i realized oh my god it is a really challenging business and i would usually counsel actors to stick with television that's even before streaming really powered mm-hmm. up and now that uh streaming is powered up and it's attracted so many filmmakers actors and so much more content where you could actually story tell over eight, 10 episodes rather than try to cram a story into two hours or a low budget film. They're just being made. I'm just amazed that, and I'm, I'm involved in them. I'm just still amazed that they ever get made, especially these days, mm. how challenging that is to, uh, to make independent films because it's always been challenging. Mm. Um, so actors who were attracted to them, fantastic, but there were so many other um, opportunities to, to work um, yeah, internationally, especially for, for the international actors. Um, I remember reading in uh, one of the business, uh, entertainment business journals that Netflix is doing so well because um, they don't have to pay as much to US stars to star in their projects when, when especially for series when they can pick up international series out of spain like money Heist, like money heist yeah exactly uh, Korea, squid Korea, game exactly and they just capture the imagination of audiences and audiences all over the world have become sophisticated to international content which means hiring international actors as well so it's a good time in this world uh for content and for actors and that's the positive message that i always try to impart to actors wherever i go uh, on whatever project i'm working on that that uh as we get through this and and with resiliency and fortitude here and a little bit of patience we um will find ourselves as we were before the pandemic i think in a really sort of golden age here for actors it's interesting. I read, um, you, have you heard of stage 32? You'll, you'll have heard of stage 32 potentially the, it's like a sort of, uh, film industry acting professional social network, uh, 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 for lack of a better term, it's sort of like a LinkedIn, but just for entertainment, creative people. And they, and I'm going to paraphrase this and maybe terribly misquote it but from what they from what they put out last week they made a, a deal with Netflix um, to basically help provide more access to their community of creatives producers writers up and coming directors on the localized side of things like you were saying it's sort of championing on a global level ways for people to get their more localized content in front of Netflix um, EVPs but not specifically out of just LA or New York, but to your point, Amsterdam, Sweden, Oslo, wherever, because there's that craving for the content on a local scale that then the platform can, if it tweaks, put out there, you know, insert market here, which I just thought was really interesting, not just because of the global reach, but because it puts power back into the hands of the creatives, right? Like, to make content, to then pitch it and have the opportunity now where it's not just five or six major players in town and you can't really get in, um, which I thought was fascinating. And I'd be keen to get your take on, for anyone that doesn't know, you have that experience of obviously working at MGM. You mentioned more on the TV side of things and you worked you know, very very you know, heavily in that world, but kind of pre-streamer. How, how different do you feel that role would have been for you if it were happening now in the streaming world? Would you have done anything differently? What's your take on that? 
It has changed a lot. Casting directors, I think, have to be so much. We were always on top of things based on the talent that we had available and the content that was uh, uh, was uh, available to the market at the time, which was uh, mainstream television, um, more and more cable channels. Um, and syndication. Mm -hmm. So that was a very, very key business, especially at a studio with MGM was such a strong library. So it was a factory of 20 to 22 episode pickups every year. I remember a couple of years, we had 44 episode pickups on series that would just be ordered by us. So, so that doesn't happen that way anymore. Um, there are so many more projects now. Uh, projects are now limited, some of them to eight or 10 episodes, which makes it challenging for actors, writers, producers to be able to commit to several projects that may overlap and they have to choose, but it's sort of an embarrassment of, of riches out there. So uh, also, uh, this is also a fantastic development is that um, uh, diversity has exploded in our marketplace. Uh, and that is fabulous because it's something I think casting directors have always been frustrated about. I know I was uh, uh, working at a studio, not because they were specific about uh, what they wanted to see. It's more that there wasn't really too much of a precedent to see anything else. Mm -hmm. And now that that has uh, expanded, it has created an opportunity for so many more actors that didn't exist before, that have been given a chance to tell stories that have never been told before, that were always out there by people we don't, haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. And that makes the job of a casting director so much more challenging too, because now we have to throw that net far wider than we used to, um, even though we thought we were dancing as fast as we can, could then, now it's just become, how do you keep up? And with that keeping up, Paul, is that a mixture of trusting more in those relationships with agents, managers, but also leveraging casting partnerships with other people in other parts of the world? Does it vary by project where you would just do it all how do you kind of tackle that being that it's such a bigger kind of pie that you're trying to carve into there? Yeah, it's pretty collaborative. It always has been. Um, many of the projects I had worked on then and to this day are not necessarily filmed in Los Angeles. So I've always had to rely on partners, casting partners, uh, contacts, agents worldwide. I've had a great opportunity to travel quite a bit, uh, film festivals, um, uh, panels, teaching. I love doing that. And I love being able to, to go around the world because we have had to, uh, uh, even 10, 15, 20 years ago, a lot of the projects we were working on were international projects, uh, shows like Spartacus, which shot in New Zealand. We had five, seven, five or seven casting directors all over the world scouting. That those relationships continue and and I think have expanded. Uh, and we do rely upon ourselves because you just can't do this by yourself. Although we're we're we have to rely upon so many more. Um, uh, venues to find actors too, YouTube and, and social media. And uh, uh, we can't possibly watch everything. So we rely upon not only actors to be able to, to produce content, like you said, in a way that wasn't possible when I was an actor growing up in, in the business and, and also rely upon agents and, and managers and folks who are trying to do the same thing, discovering new talent uh, for projects that, that didn't exist before, mm -hmm. looking for new talent that didn't exist, at least in front of us before. Yeah, was I, I guess it's that, it, yeah, it's always been there. It's just the platforms are more readily available and the opportunity to 
it's terrible. It's not put pressure because that's not the word, but that's all that's coming to mind. But to sort of articulate the desire for these stories, it's easier to go to the internet and put that out there and, and get traction and see that there's demand for it as well. And obviously we didn't have the YouTubes and the TikToks and the Instagrams, you know, 15, 20 years ago, like they are now. I'm assuming it probably feels in some ways like there's more actors just because there's so much more coming at you. So I'm going to flip it from the actor's side for people that are obviously going to be listening in and ask that awful question of how, how, how would actors get on people's radars and what do you advise them to do and how to target that? And is creating their own content an option and a choice, or do you feel like it's almost sort of a requirement or an essential thing now, if there is such a thing? It is essential. It is essential. I think to be smart about social media, but to be on it, you need to make a little bit of noise or you won't be heard because everyone else is. And it depends how you make it and how it comes out, sure. right? And how it's uh, framed. Uh, and you, you need to be smart about that with, with uh, social media overall, because you see the trouble you can get into, how sensitive social media can be. And artists, I always, you know, I tell actors when I, when I speak with them also that social media should be used to, uh, to promote in a subtle, but um, uh, a subtle way, but certainly get the message out there of what you're working on and how grateful you are. Blessed is a very popular word these days. You can't get canceled by saying blessed ever. <laughs> so um, just about everything else can almost cancel a person these days. So you have to be careful what, you're, what you say out there. Keep it about uh, the positivity of the projects you're working on. Of course, it's going to be all about you. It always is. And it probably should be. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's about everybody. It's about everybody. Everybody. It's all about them. And it doesn't matter whether you're an actor or not. So um, actors get the bad rub sometimes for being self-obsessed. Well, dang, you probably should be a little bit. You've got a uh, a product that you've honed and marketed and it's you and you need to sell that. Just be smart about how you do that um, uh, and thank the people around you for the opportunities and and uh, 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 keep it always uh, as positive a message as you can. And yes, you do have to create content and you can and you should. And I am seeing demo reels that are being created without actual films being shot or even short films being shot. They are shot on red cameras. I see really good examples of what looked like well done independent film scenes that are really what they are is crafted scenes for the actor to showcase themselves. Mm -hmm. That never existed. It's been going on for a while. It's getting better and better. And uh, actors should be doing that. And it can be done at a cost these days. And we have to be able to see some work out there. Sure. There's no excuse not to. And if you are student actors, uh, 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 filmmakers or, or film students or actors who are just starting their careers and some of your audience may be that, uh, there's no excuse anymore not to be able to create content because quite frankly, if I release a breakdown, I'm not going to be looking at any actor unless they have a demo reel, mm -hmm. unless they're a kid, you know, they're young actors. And then we cut a lot of slack because we're looking for, you know, potential uh, and personality and, and what a, a 10 year old can bring to material that uh, we expect more from a 20 or 25 year old who's already out there. So that's my challenge really to all, all of the actors out there is, and it's not the biggest challenge in the world to, to take on is, is, do create content for yourselves because that's how we judge the potential of you, the possibility of asking you either through an agent or directly to self tape, mm -hmm. which is how the world works these days. So it's democratized the entire audition process. It's created a lot more opportunities for actors to self tape, but we are getting more and more self tapes than ever. And you need to be able to harness as well as you can, you know, your, your potential and uh, uh, based on your training and experience 
and repetition of self-taping these days so that you make the best impression you can because you never know when we're watching it. We're certainly not watching you live in the room anymore unless we're doing a Zoom callback. Uh, we're watching you at two in the morning after a rough day and you need to be able to capture our attention with a really strong demo reel, really strong self-tape and, uh, and still really strong headshots. And let's pull on that thread a little bit then, Paul, because obviously demo reel is like one thing. Obviously, that's that's you, how you come across in a fully formed uh, performance, even if it's just specifically for a small scene. It's still you collaborating with other filmmakers, whereas a, a, a self-tape is a different kind of animal. It's still you seeing us on screen, but it's you still, you know, seeing us raw with just sort of that character. There's not really an arc necessarily to a bigger story. Um, and you're talking about, yeah, like something that people probably don't even think about when you even watch it two in the morning or, or random times of the day. And, and you don't have any other information beyond just what's on that screen to go by the, the phrasing of stand out or make an impression, I think is, is, is totally accurate, but I know can get confusing for actors in terms of what does that really mean? Cause I think we can read that sometimes as doing more or like trying to show or signal or do something in the first five seconds with a prop or whatever it might be to be like, hey, here I am. So I know that's not what you mean, but if you could maybe just delve a little bit deeper into what does that look like for you? How, how do you interpret that? How can someone get your attention through that tape? Yes, and, and that's a really good question because as actors think they have to make that impression in the first five or 10 seconds. And yes, you do. However, it, it, it's really born of uh, really taking whatever that scene is that you're working on and really, I mean, it's a tired hackney phrase, but doing the work, you really have to break it, the scene down into what, what, especially in this new cinematic world we're working in, uh, uh, how you can, you really sort of be on your toes in the scene and really be present in the scene. And so in the first five or 10 seconds, 15 seconds, we get a sense of an actor who, who understands what the material is, brings their point of view to it. Um, uh, 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 there's a, uh, an also a very tired uh, word that actors or casting directors and sometimes directors use. They like actors who make bold choices. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. like that because what actors filter that in is bigger and louder and trying to grab our attention with something that may have nothing to do with the text or the scene. Um, uh, and what I, when I tell actors, I like bold choices that when they make bold choices, I say bold choices can be subtle as long as they're specific, that's bold, not bigger and louder, especially for, for the cinematic frame we're looking at actors now. Um, uh, and I remember one of my first acting teachers, uh, when I was in school, told me that uh, acting is the detailed, bloody detective work that must be done in order to creatively reveal a character. I almost quit then because I went, I, I, I'm here for fun. I'm here. I don't want to be a forensic person. That's what? You know, that sounds like a lot of work. I just want to have fun and do scenes. And then you realized what you really have to do and what I find a lot of actors don't do enough of is that detailed bloody detective work and uh, support the material, whether it's a short scene or, or uh, a scene with more of an arc. Uh, and it's the subtle things. It's those little moments that an actor brings to a self tape and in the room that make a difference. And it just, it, I, I, think, I think an actor knows, has to know how to sort of uh, do that kind of work to really bring the best kind of uh, self-tape audition, especially since you guys are working in a vacuum. You don't necessarily have or ever really have the feedback that you used to have. Mm -hmm. And then you uh, send in the best audition you can and hope for the best. And, um, and I think you can feel good about that if you guys feel like you're doing the kind of work you need to do to at least show us that you're a good actor, whether you're right for that role or not. It makes it easier to detach from that and just move on with your life. And, you know, if you hear from it, great, you know, but that's like the super 10 cherries on top of the icing, on top of the next layer of icing, you know, like that's, 
not the expectation. But if you feel like you've not done the job or done a tape that really resonates with you and then you step away from it, you just end up feeling a bit flat, like, oh, okay, I've not explored that fully and, and, and done the work. Um, yeah, and, you know, just to, to add to that while we're on that, you know, I've, there, there are actors that I'm now coaching sort of when I have time internationally all over as well too. And, and, you know, their agents are really happy with what they're getting before they send it out. And yet sometimes they just don't book or they don't hear. And, and there's, I've been getting sort of feedback about frustration about, I feel so good about what we do and my agents are really happy. And yet this goes out there into a vacuum and, and we don't know what happens? And these are in all sorts of different markets. Um, the, the tell on that is eventually when that casting director that you're submitting to, when you start to get another call for a different project or a different role for something else consistently. And I'm finding because we're looking so internationally now, a lot of actors who didn't have a chance, I'll use Canada as an example. We weren't bringing up as many American actors for a while to Canada. So they had to hire Canadian actors and all those actors who were doing co-stars or small principal roles were now getting the chance to read for guest star roles and series regulars because this was their time to, to go big really. And all of a sudden, those actors who were doing the smaller roles maybe weren't booking right away, but as casting directors started to watch their work and think, wow, oh, they're getting better and better and better. They're getting really good at this. Let's bring them back for something else. And those actors, six months, eight months later, are starting to book. So uh, don't get too discouraged by all of this because you put it out there. And if the work is good, we will notice, we will make those notes like we always have when you guys were in the room, maybe not for this, but really good actor, maybe for something else. And over time, you will, uh, I think, uh, all of the actors out there who do that kind of work will start to reap more rewards from that, I hope. I it's that think. balance, right? It's sort of, there's the business, which is imperative. And I think people, at least from from the American side, I think the business is is more prevalent to dive into it. I think We've got better in Europe, but I don't think it's being sort of like focal point number one, but it's essential. But also on the other side of it, there's the artistry and the craft and they have to come together, but they also live in sort of two separate spaces at times, because what you're talking about to me sounds a lot like being the business side, but also still hone your artistry with classes, making your own work, working with other peers theater, whatever, like, you know, rehearse reads on Zoom, just to keep the muscle active with no end result, whatever that means to kind of get off the back of it. And as you're doing that, there's less pressure that I have to nail this one audition. So then eventually you look and go to your point in six months, you know, that office calls me back again. And maybe that's the one that you hit because you've just been progressively slowly chipping away at your craft. Yeah, and it's also being consistent. The more consistent you are in, in the preparation, the work that you submit, every single self-tape now, and, I, and I, I think actors are getting a lot more self-tapes than they ever used to because it's easy for us to just click and say, okay, fine, have them self-tape needed by Wednesday. You know, no sweat off our nose, really, because it's really up to you guys at that point. But we're not we're not seeing actors in the room now. So all those casting sessions back when we first met, you know, it would be a factory of actors coming in all day long. And I loved it, you know, but we don't see actors that way um, anymore. And I suspect probably not for a while. So uh, the upside is that a lot more actors have the opportunity to self-tape and the, the downside is a lot more actors have the yeah. opportunity to self tape. Uh, so please don't get discouraged by that. If you do have the opportunity, uh, commit to it every time. Uh, you have many more opportunities now to create your own, uh, your own reality now. If, uh, well, now we see everybody with bookshelves behind them, right? So they're smart. 
And, and let's say you have to play a psychiatrist or a doctor or something like that. Why not go into your library, have a bookshelf behind you and actually sit behind your desk and do the self tape that way? Because that's how we're seeing you guys now. Why not create as much of a cinematic experience for the casting director rather than always just have the blue screen in the background, which is fantastic and making sure your lighting and your tech and your sound is right. That's great. But you can create an environment depending on what the scene is that helps support who you are in the scene and create a certain reality because the, the downside of always coming into that sterile audition room when you were in my office here with this spectacular high rise and yet my casting office was kind of a factory with a tape room that looked like you know, a doctor's office almost, you know, and, and you guys had to come in and create this imaginary world and bring it to life in front of a reader and three or four, you know, decision makers and convince us that what you're doing feels authentic and real. The advantage now is that you can actually do that at home and, and dress your set without it being distracting use props in a way that we ne had never been allowed before. Uh, I'm very supportive of that as long as it supports the scene. So you have a, a, a larger palette to sort of play on here as well, too. If you do that in a smart way, I've seen some surprisingly effective self tapes. Um, uh, in fact, one actor that I had just worked with, we, um, uh, she was doing it in front of her blue screen and, and it was set in a kitchen. And I said, where are you? And she said, I'm home. I said, let's, let's, let's do this in your kitchen. You're cooking, you're making spaghetti sauce, you're drinking wine, you're talking to your best friend across the counter. We can do all that in your kitchen. And she submitted a bang up audition that looked like an actual film audition mm. in the environment. So it created this this not imaginary world or a, a real world for, for the actors. So be specific about that, but it can be really helpful. And another uh, reason why some of this is working out better for actors than, um, than it used to when you'd walk in the room. However, one day you guys will have to walk back in the room again. So all that fear and anxiety of, and the rejection and all of those things that plague actors and always have, as they do all of us, um, will be back. So don't get too comfortable just acting from the chest up, right? Sure. Or the neck up. You're going to have to come in and- You're going to have to put on pop. pants and shoes one day is what you're telling people, that's all, basically. Right. Basically, that's what's going to have to happen. And of course, I'm wearing sweatpants right now, so I should talk. But, we all uh, we all are, it's all good. Right. But, yeah. but I do, you, I mean, you're right. And even, you know, even if that's not the case, you get the job, you got to go to set and do this too. And it's this, you know, it's another extension of whatever we might've felt with those nerves or anxiety or whatever the term might be. And I guess part of this skewers a little away from pure play technique and into the realm of, you know, just general self-awareness as a human being, not solely as an artist and, and an actor. And I think, at a point, and I'm sure you will have no doubt seen it with all the stuff you've worked on, the talent's always going to be at a level that the talent's great. So the distinguishing factor has to be something more than that, right? And it's that sort of ethereal thing of, I guess you feeling that that person as a person matches with the show and the character and everything else, but also even that aside that you have the confidence that they can just handle themselves with what is about to be entrusted to them. That's not exactly an acting kind of question, but I feel it is the more that I delve into this. Like, how are you, when you do workshops with actors across the world, how often does that sort of come up? The more mindset, headspace, how are you approaching this holistically kind of question? All the time. It comes up all the time. And it's really important to address that. Uh, not only for self-tape, but especially when you start interacting with others in, in um, uh, the way we used to, which we will again, and on set, of course, too. We need to see an actor uh, who comes into the room, before they come into the room, really feel prepared, take that moment to, to actually start to slip subtly into the shoes of that character 
uh, depending on what kind of role it is. And again, it's genre, it, it depends on the type of character you're playing, but the performance starts as you're in that waiting room before you come in and, and preparing how pre that you always have to be present when you walk in that room prepared. We need to feel that you're confident and that you've left your ego outside and you put on your sandbox shoes and you're like ready to play. And there's a uh, preparation and humility and, and that you're listening. That's a hard thing for people to do these days. No one really listens to each other anymore. We see it politically. We see it in our conversations. I see it when I talk to people, sometimes eyes are wandering. People's attention spans are really narrow. Uh, we're distracted so easily these days. Actors are no different. Uh, especially when you're in your own head about a scene and you're not necessarily present and listening enough. That's an art that's uh, in danger of being lost. So it's something that we all need to work on more and more and specifically actors to be really present and in the moment listening to uh, adjustments being made uh, and then execute on them as well too. So when we see actors who are consistently doing that, and not getting in their own way, not getting in their own heads and just being present there, then we just feel it. We know that they've come in because they're, they're prepared, they're confident. Uh, they, have a, um, they have a point of view about how they wanna approach a character, but they're not married to it. They're open to suggestions if you're lucky enough to get it. Their auditions aren't set in granite or stone, they're set in jello. So there's some wiggle room there. Those are the actors I like to see. That's what I do when I work with actors, whether it's in the room, with far less time, obviously, but perhaps in a in a workshop. Uh, and, and this goes for any actor anywhere in the world, international actors, there's a common language there. And, and that's what we try to speak so that consistently they can bring that kind of performance um, into the audition space um, uh, as consistently as possible. Yeah. Did you feel like a lot of this sort of lack of attention and attention deficit that we all seem to have is just the bombardment we're getting consistently from devices and news and media and just how that spills to content too from a creative perspective, right? Like YouTube is full of micro content, small shows, small scenes. Do you feel like people's attention for the longer form 90 minute, two hour film or, or 60 minute episodes is almost that those things are too much to bite off. I, I see it in myself sometimes where I go, oh, put down your goddamn phone when you're 20 minutes into an episode. Like, why am I going for that impulse to check something else? Why can't you just connect with watching the show? Whereas in the theater, at least you turn that thing off and you go, wow, that was so amazing. And it's just because you are forced to be immersed into it. But is there a danger that we might be losing or have lost some of that, you know, not just listening to other people in a room acting, but listening to, as a regular viewer, the content that we're watching? Wow, we're getting deep. Sorry, yeah. sorry. No, oh, but I, I love that. And it's something that, that I think we are in danger of, of losing. And sometimes it's good to just kind of check out of that. And, and, and I think that's what's happening, uh, has been happening during this pandemic too, is, is uh, because it's less noisy in a way, we're not engaging socially quite as much. So it does allow us to be a little more hopefully introspective. I've never considered myself an overly introspective person because I've been moving so fast for so long. Sure. And you know, you skip, you're the skipping stone. And you sort of go wide, but it's given us an opportunity. I know I've been able to, to do more of that with some difficulty is going a little bit deeper and, and being a little more introspective in, in our own lives and our own experiences here, rather than always feel like we're bombarded as we can be with, with what's around us. But look what's happening now. This gives all of us an opportunity to take a beat and sort of disconnect from all that and and uh, <clears throat> listen to listen to what's maybe going on more inside of us or or out in nature and really take that time not only to to sort of recharge but reevaluate as well too so yeah it's sort of a double-edged sword 
we are bombarded, but we do need, because we are isolated in some ways, to sort of uh, embrace that a little yeah. bit more and see what we maybe have been missing, you know, and and what's been surface that we could have gone deeper on. And I think that really is great for actors too, because it it, it does allow um, uh, actors or any creative artist to to look inside themselves for um, for what um, they may not have even realized was there until they started discovering it. I guess that's a big part of the work, right? Like just that ongoing exploration of self and how you can bring that to any given role in any given genre, which, um, yeah, it's that kind of bloody kind of scarring work that you spoke about where you're kind of, you know, just continually trying to understand that. Um, I'd like to go back a few seconds before I got and made this all Freudian um and just talk about the 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 coming into the room and and especially when it comes to languages and accents because i know you work with obviously international actors you mentioned that um you know being an international actor i know many people that don't speak english as a first language and oftentimes the question will come up and you probably had this what what do you recommend people do when they're maybe coming in to play a character who say is an American, but that's not their native accent. Maybe they're Brit or an Australian or from Eastern Europe and they sound different normally and you don't know them. Do you prefer them to come in as them, as the human with their regular everyday accent and then traverse into what the character requires? Or do you feel it's better for them to come in with the accent of the character? And if they're gonna drop out, do that once the performance is done. And I guess as a bonus question is how does that translate from a self-tape perspective? Yeah, good, good question. Uh, it's the latter, absolutely, for me. I like the actor to come in and trick us into believing from the very first word that comes out of their mouth, the hello, the greeting, whether it's virtual or in the room, uh, I will know most likely but maybe my producer director won't know. And they'll just, they won't sometimes even look at a resume sometimes. So the actor will come in and it's show me. And all of a sudden, after you finish your introduction and the scene, and then we have a little bit of chit chat. I love when you guys drop into your accents. Then it's, <gasps> as long as it's a great accent. I mean, Sorry. if it's really good, because if you start with the accent and then shift over into your American accent, we, our ears will be looking, looking for the flaw, looking for the vowel that isn't quite right. And we'll be distracted by it rather than if you're really good at, at an American accent and you're hundred percent on it, come in with it, do the scene with it. And then all of a sudden you're David Copperfield. Like, how did they do that? I mean, oh my gosh, you guys are amazing. Uh, even if the acting wasn't even great, it was like, oh, wow. How did they do that? Um, uh, but it really is, uh, I, I think that's what I've seen the most success with actors who are able to pull that off. You had a second part of the question. Just with the self tip, I guess, obviously you do it all in the accent of the character, but say there's a slate, if that's asked for an ident of any description, just keep it in the accent of the character. Yeah, I think so. I think for a self tape, yeah. I think that's, that's uh, I like to see in a self tape, a certain consistency there. Um, and that can also work for you in the room, perhaps too. keep it all consistent. But I've I've loved to watch actors or directors eyes sort of open up when they when they see that an actor is from Australia or South Africa or usually the Commonwealth countries. It's it's more challenging, I think, for Eastern European actors, uh, South American actors, um, uh, actors outside Commonwealth countries to really nail that American accent. But but I've seen it. Mm -hmm. For, for those, I guess, people who, you know, speak a totally different language and, and they can obviously do that as well as English speaking roles. When we're talking then about things like a demo reel, do you feel like it's beneficial to have them speaking English and then let's just assume Spanish is the language, Spanish as part of the same reel? Do you think it's better to have a Spanish reel and an English reel as separate or is it more character driven? What, what's your take on that from a business marketing point of view? Yeah, I like the a la carte uh, uh, 
which I, you can do now on, on the platforms is Spanish speaking real, English speaking real. We like to be able to, especially if we're casting Spanish actors who speak English, let's say, we're going to be looking at that English real first. And if we're intrigued, we'll, we'll shift over to the Spanish real because things can be different on that reel. Uh, uh, and we want to see if there's an ease of, of, uh, of, the, of the same kind of grasp of the character and the same ease with language, whether it's Spanish or English, and how that affects the performance as well, too. So usually I'll look at both. But it's nice to be able to give us the opportunity to choose what we want to see first and, and give us the, the option of realizing that maybe a casting director only has a minute or, or a couple of minutes to look. So give us the options, give us the, the you know, an appetizer of each so mm -hmm. that we can mm -hmm. taste it and see if it, if, if we like it. Would you say the same with the tape? What's, some people prefer just one take from the tape. Do you feel like if there's a second that's, you know, completely different or a different choice or a different perspective, do you like to get a couple of options to then pick what you would then send on? Or would you just like one and trust that the actor is confident with that? Yeah, that, uh, that depends. It depends, but you know, when you guys get self-tape instructions from casting, it's sometimes two pages long of instructions. And usually they will either give you permission to do an extra take, depending on the size of the role. Sure. I, uh, if I'm uh, just like when actors would come in and it's a under five line role or a co-star, we'll do it two or three different ways or two or three different yeah okay. right but so yeah. i'll i don't mind seeing that on a self-tape and once in a while when i've worked with an actor and they come to me just even for a co-star to, to help them on a zoom or a self-tape i'll say let's do it a couple of different ways and it, i think you should submit both of those because they're really good they're just different and it'll show some range and it's really only 15 or 20 seconds each yeah. so uh i as a cast director i would love to see that uh on a guest star a larger role you gotta have to Pretty yeah, much, yeah. that's given permission. You pretty much should follow, and that's really important to follow the directions specifically because casting directors are being really good about because they know that you only have this one shot, so they want to give you everything they can, whether it's access to the script, many times not access to the scene, access to whatever breakdown of the character to give you guys a fighting chance in a vacuum. To, to do the best job you can when you submit. Yeah, makes total sense. With with those slightly juicier, bigger roles, the guests, the series regs, to your point, many times, yeah, you don't get the full script for whatever reason. Um, so it then becomes a different way of fishing for the clues, right? You can work with what sides you've got and obviously maybe look at who's attached and some of the work they've done previously. But what other tips or advice do you give actors in terms of how they can mine for clues to then craft that performance when you don't have the full idea of what the story is? You use your imagination. What? It's insanity. <laughs> <laughs> what? Asking um, creatives to use oh their imagination. God. You really do. It's a technique that acting students learn. If you don't have the personal experience, you don't have all the information, you fill in the gaps with your imagination, the what ifs. This, well, what about this idea for this? Where I don't quite know exactly, and it's, I don't have all the information. You, you think of a, a way of approaching the scene that works for you, and you fill in those gaps with with the, your imagination. If you don't know, make it up and go for it. We'll appreciate that. When I work with actors, I always do that. I don't give them much information when I give them a scene. So if what you don't know, fill in. Show me, show me what you think this character, where you think this character is coming from or, or what his motivation or her motivation might be in the scene. Surprise me. And we will always, even if it's the wrong path, we know that you don't have all the information when we see actors auditions. And part of it is, is filling in sort of the puzzle in your own way. It shows me that the actor is actually doing some real investigation on that. And it should be fun. I mean, it's bloody, yeah, it is torturous sometimes, but you've got to do that. And then um, surprise us because uh, the actors who really make the impression for me and always have through my career are the ones who come in and do something uh, that is unexpected yet totally is supported by the text itself. 
And that's the key, right? Using whatever you've got with the text to then support that imaginative process and then make it just feel true and authentic to you. And, and I guess finally trusting that, right? Because there's that part that can crop up where you go as an actor, is this what they want? It's obviously not what you want to do, but you can go, is this right? Is this is this what it's supposed to be? And all those things that we go through in our journey. And to your point, I guess you just want to throw that away and see what comes out. Yeah. And just uh, look at the options and just don't take your first one. Mm-hmm. You know, because we we can get lazy, all of us sometimes. We go, well, that's my first instinct, so I'm just going to go with that. Okay, maybe. But what if you look at it in the scene or, or, or your opening beat or your button at the end, your closing beat, or that, that you can either physicalize or, or have um, a, a way of bringing that scene to a, uh, an interesting landing that, that, that's, that's, that works. It's not always your first choice. Mm-hmm. So you got to sort of sit there with it and think about it and then put, try to puzzle it out and then go with one. Go with the one that you find is the most interesting approach to the scene and f- that works for you. And if you do have a chance to do it a couple different ways, then do that. But it, it, I've seen actors too often just take the easy road and sort of go with their first choice and their first instinct and without really doing the investigation. And that's what I think, what I get a chance to do when, I'm, when I am working with actors. And yeah, you can do it on Zoom very well. I mean, I'm really happy to be working with groups all over the world and, and uh, being asked by guests uh, like Lucy Lennox and folks out of Barcelona to, great, you know, yeah. to work. And I, I might be getting there in April to, to do something live with them or, uh, uh, and and we get to do this, you know, with actors in Toronto and Vancouver and here. And that's the great thing for actors, too. They're able to do this now. In fact, you guys are able to work with acting coaches, acting teachers, not just audition coaches or, or casting directors who, who, who teach, but actual acting teachers virtually. Some of the greatest in the world are doing this. You don't have to come to L.A. to sit in a classroom. Do we do you miss it? Sure. Do I miss being able to sit in on an acting class, uh, uh, absolutely. Some of the great uh, acting teachers out there, sure. Um, but look what you have access to. It well, truly- that's that thing, yeah. right? To bring it full circle, it's that democratization where if you're not in a major market, you don't have to live there per se anymore. You need access to it because the time will come where you do need to probably be there for something. But it's a choice. If you want to live there on a personal level, that's a choice you can make, but it's not the be all and end all anymore. Whereas I think when I first met you in 09, it was kind of like, if you're going to come and work in in the U S you kind of have to be here. And, and that's, you know, just not quite as pure play like that anymore, which is. No, it isn't. And remember we were focusing on, I mean, half our conversations were about visas and how do we get to this country? And, you know, there was a part of me that wanted you guys just stay in London, get the get your real, get your experience. You're not going to be accepted in this country unless you have a body of work that gives you that opportunity. Otherwise, you're going to be just floating around in this big old pool and not sh- sure if you have the goods to be able to to sell here where you can develop your skills in, in your backyard. Uh, it's even more so now. I mean, it's that's another point of empowerment for actors too, that you don't have to do that. And you have access to so much more just here, like we're doing right now than ever existed before. And it puts a human face to what we do. And, and uh, um, it's much more porous really uh, with information, with personality, with conversations, uh, with information, uh, so actors should feel like, you know, there's enough pressure with, with you guys, with, with artists just to try to get seen and, and, and be noticed. And, um, you know, I suggest that, that Los Angeles doesn't have to be that place, that Mecca, at, at least at this moment, that it had always been in the past, that you will have your opportunities. And again, because we mentioned how international productions are being made these days in, in major markets all over the world that uh, 
that just take a deep breath and, you know, become the best actor you can be in your own backyard before. Uh, and then we will find you. Mm, you more, come now here, more than ever. Now yes, more than ever. <laughs> we will find you. Uh, let us come to you. Let us discover you because we're looking at all of these projects in, in foreign markets. Um, when you came here and the doors were being shut and you said, well, I've got my visa. I've got my green card. I've spent thousands for this and that. So now you're in competition with all these American actors, right? And yes, you're in this environment. You have access in a way to a lot that's going on here, but that's not happening quite as much. Yeah, exactly. Right for now. Yeah. So take a deep breath, get really good at doing what you do, where you are, take classes internationally if you can, virtually, and uh, step by step, you know, it, uh, think of all of this as a, a real positive. Uh, yes, there are some negatives, obviously, you know, the, but we all know that, but human beings tend to sometimes um, focus on the negative. Sometimes right? that's kind of what's being ingrained into the human psyche. It's called, uh, yeah, marketing, I think. Um, yeah, well, yes, no, no. you know, well, that, that's true. We all do, you know, the, the good stuff we tend to take for granted sometimes when it happens, like, oh, that's great. That happened. Sure. That's awesome. But the bad stuff, we just, you know, when do you ever write in? I know what I write in my journal. It's never about the great stuff. It's always about the challenging stuff, right? They're like, I'm going through here or there on a project, or it's always the, the awful stuff. And I, and I even mentioned that when I wrote, had a, uh, an entry. And I, I said, you know, you're, you're just focusing on all the negatives here. Why don't you focus on all this great stuff that's happening as part of this? Because I've already got that. I've already got it. I don't need it anymore. It's already here. I want, the, I want more. I need more. I want more. We all I want always more. Want more. Right? I well, think to yeah, your point, that's maybe shifted a little bit, hopefully for quite a lot of people with everything that's been going on. And um, I think you kind of said earlier, we're, we're kind of adaptation machines as humans in some ways. So I think as we re readjust and reacclimatize to whatever, you know, the world's bringing our way, I think there's a little bit more perspective that a lot of us are having on, okay, yeah, yeah well, going for a walk is actually kind of nice. I really took that for granted three years ago. And now it's, you know, you, you do appreciate the small things a bit more. And, you know, I think if we keep that moving forward, then we're going to be in a good place. Yeah. And also with each other as well, too. And that can sometimes be difficult to do, not only with ourselves, but with, with just being a little more patient and um, gentle, kinder to each other and that's challenging sometimes especially in this, in this divisive world we're living in but i think that's really the only way because um, um especially with artists how deeply feeling artists are uh it can be very destructive if if you focus only on the things that anger you or upset you and rather than the things where there's you're grateful for you know where there's light and opportunity um uh, not only within ourselves, but, um, you know, with those around us that we care about. Absolutely. Paul, it's, it's been a blast. I, I like to wrap these up with uh, 10 quick fire questions, which I've like all good artists do stolen straight from inside the actor studio, because, you know, you have to steal as an artist. Um, and it's a nice homage, I think to the show. So I'm just going to fire the questions at you, whatever comes to mind. Let's see what your sort of responses are. And then we'll, we'll button this off. So the first question is, what's your favorite word? Passion. What's your least favorite word? Fear. What turns you on creatively? Imagination. What turns you off? Hmm. <sighs> so many. <laughs> just pick one don't be greedy come yeah, on man. just okay. uh, 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 narrow-mindedness fifth is optional it's what's your favorite swear word if you don't want to swear we can pass if you do be my guest square word swear oh. curse word oh swear <laughs> in any language if that helps because as a spanish speaker some spanish ones are pretty yeah good. We'll, we'll pass on that because okay. 
You just, all you have to do is sit in the back seat of my car. You will hear all of them as I drive through LA. Oh, that and was I you? Laugh every that, time that, I see them, it's so much fun. That was you. Okay. And next time I'm back out there, I'll know. <laughs> I'll know. Okay. Amazing. Um, what's your favorite noise? Um, a fart. This is the I first just, time anyone <laughs> said that. I love it. They're almost always original and they make me always giggle. And uh, it really uh, keeps people very human. That's true. We should all be more like farts in some ways. In some ways. In some ways. In some ways. <laughs> What's your least favorite sound? Um. A, a, a sort of a, a, a torture yeah a, you know just the sounds that go with it sound of of pain i think yeah what job or profession other than the ones that you've attempted would you most like to attempt writing do you ever get a chance to do that or just for like on a personal level personal and and um working uh, on some stuff being more yeah Yes, cool. hard, but it's something I've always thought What's about. What's the what, I, I, quickly? Because I, I I am intrigued. Because when it comes to writing, I also find it's hard. But it's the sitting down part that's hard. It's like the Stephen Pressfield thing from talking about you know the resistance is the word he uses, and 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 the resistance isn't necessarily when you're in the flow. It's getting your ass in the chair and just doing that consistently every day is that what you find hard or is there other it is. it's the and it's really just starting it's what every writer has always talked Said, about it yeah. the procrastination that we have um that we don't have as much excuse for anymore because we do have maybe a little more time to we'll do find it. excuses don't don't <laughs> we will always find excuses right you're right. Have you read Stephen King's on writing? Just on I, a, I'm reading it now, actually. Oh, amazing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fine. I won't say anything. It's just I found that fascinating that a writer of that caliber says all the things that you've probably had in your head and I've had in my head and things that he thought were going to be garbage turned out to be some of his best work. And you're just like, okay, well, who am I then to not write if he's gone through that? Yeah. It makes you feel a little more optimistic that if he goes through those things, just like actor stories too, sure. right? You know, actors that we all think, you know, oh, they're all movie stars. Well, believe me, they all had origin stories too. And they were pretty torturous, a lot of them. Definitely. Definitely. What job would you never want to do? Um, sing because I'd be so bad at it. Final question, a little bit more ethereal for you, Paul. When it's all said and done, what would you like the story of your life to be? What kind of legacy would you like to leave? Well, it, it, hopefully it's, it's a legacy of doing work, uh, uh, being kind and being gracious and being supportive of of actors and and hopefully those around me, which I know we struggle with, but really to leave, leave a legacy where where after you're gone, you know people say, gosh, I I really really liked working with him. I liked talking with him. I liked being in the room with him, and and he gave me something to aspire to. I love that, man. I love that. Um, final moments are over to you. I always give it to the guests. Just if you want to let people know what you've got going on, where they can connect with you, any workshops. And if there's a final message you want to leave people with to button this off with, I'll kind of leave yeah. those final words to you. Well, depending on who, I do have an actor dedicated uh, email. So actors can reach out that way. Uh, please don't bombard me with a lot of questions, but actors can always reach out uh, Paul Weber casting at gmail.com. I also have a Facebook group page that's Paul Weber casting where actors put their work up, talk, I monitor it, but I don't over 
uh, uh, my presence is more watching what actors are doing and seeing what actors are doing. Occasionally I'll write something to them as well too. I usually do at the end of the year, a couple times a year. Um, and uh, uh, the um, as far as projects, uh, a couple international projects, um, one we're working on up in uh, British Columbia, which is an adaptation of a J.M. Barry novel uh story that we're that has been adapted for screenplay i'm really excited about that and a couple of projects that uh one in ireland one in norway that we uh are in the middle of prepping as well too and uh, as far as uh, i do coach uh privately as well and um and i hope to be i had a flurry of um of workshops in the past in person last weekend in Miami and the weekend before in Des Moines and October in uh, Zagreb. And I hope to be doing more of that because that's kind of in my DNA to be able to, to work with actors in person again. We'll have to see how things go. In the meantime, sure. this is working really well. So I just wanna make sure that you know you guys stay safe and creative and, and have uh, the best holiday season you can. And, um, and you know, hopefully we'll all have a chance to, to meet again, either live or this way.